Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So um, I wanted to first give you a little bit of a background as to the approach that we were taking going into this project. And really in order to do this, I tell you a little bit about my group, Sociodigital Systems. So we're a group within computer-mediated living, and we're made up of an interdisciplinary group of researchers. We have people such as myself who come out of the social sciences. Um, we have those that come out of the computer sciences, and then we have um, a few designers, and we're working on getting more designers. And the thing is that we like to work together as an interdisciplinary group in order to address and try to understand what do people need and want and are inspired by when it comes to technology? How do they live their lives? How can we introduce technology into those lives? What kind of technology are they drawn to and why are they drawn to that? And what can we understand about human behavior as well as human behavior in terms of um, technology use and adoption? And so we all work together. And um, we work very closely with one another, so it's very interesting to be working in this interdisciplinary group where you have the dynamics. But you also, um, we also work with the other groups um, across um, Microsoft Research Cambridge. So for this project in particular that I'm going to talk about, we've worked very closely with the Machine um, Learning and Perception Group um, because that is where the, uh, the Connect and the Skeletal Tracking System was based. And, um, Sociodigital systems as a group is in this area of computer science called human-computer interaction. So I don't know how many of you have been faced with either having to take um, an HCI course or having been um, confronted by an HCI researcher in the past. But this is, again, this broad group that's interested in the design of technology for human use. And you can look at it from a lot of different angles. You can look at it from how people use technology now to how people are not using technology, but how you can imagine introducing technology into that environment. So the thing about HCI as a field is that it's really changed over the years. So it is a very different field nowadays than it was about 10 years ago when I first got into the field. Um, HCI in the beginning was sort of like human factors. So um, back in the 70s, when computers were starting to be used by a lot of people, well, a lot of the times they were really large computers, and they were used by the military or by science groups, not as much the desktop computers that we see today, and surely nothing like the mobile phones that we all carry around with us. And so because of this human factors beginning, it was very much focused on things like um, testing for human error, creating guidelines and creating standards. And again, it was always focused on making sure people were effective and efficient in the use of technology. Well, something changed around the 1980s. Um, what happened was that we started thinking about humans as an information processing machine because we started seeing that technology was coming a little bit more pervasive. So it was leaving the, the military realm and the scientific realm, and it was um, being introduced in um, the workplace, in the general workplace, and as well as learning and education environments. And so because of that, we started thinking a little bit more broadly about what does it mean to design technology for people. And so it was very much about what information is going into this information processing unit. So what are they seeing? What are they hearing? Um, a human user. How are they processing all this information? How are they thinking about it? And then the output, which is, of course, a, a mouse click, for instance, or, um, well, I guess even back then, you know, there was still the DOS base, so even like typing a command, all of that, input, processing, and output. And that's how we thought about people for a really long time. We thought about them as individual information processing units, and HCI was very focused as a field on trying to understand how can we um, uh, make that as, as, as um, effective and efficient of a processing unit as possible, to put it in extremely clear terms that way. Well, the problem about thinking about the human as an information processing unit, for instance, um, is that you sort of miss all the other things about people. So you miss 
the fact um, that there's a thing about experience. There's a thing about fun. We have emotions that we emit. We have human values. We have societal norms that we abide by. And all of these things really don't fit very well and very succinctly inside this idea of a human as an information processing unit. So what's happened is there's this sort of what we call this third wave of HCI. And this has been fairly um, recent, I would say. Maybe you could start thinking about this in the past five to eight years. Is this is the way that HCI is starting to be thinking um, of humans living in a world with technology. That um, we're very experiential, we're situated, we're contextual. What we do doesn't make, isn't always the same, even though you have, might have the same person and the same technology from one environment to another. And so it really is trying to get at the fact that you have the artifact, you have the context, and you have the users that all really define the situation of use of technology from moment to moment. And we're really starting to view and think um, of the cognitive and the abstract um, to one where it's contextualized and part of a greater ecosystem of the environment, the people, and society. And one of the things that I can say about our group in Sociodigital Systems is that we have not only psychologists, but we also have sociologists. And sociologists really think about the human within a societal context. And this is becoming more and more important, especially when we think of the pervasiveness of the technology that we carry around in our own pockets on an everyday level. Um, the technology that's following us along the walls that are becoming ubiquitous in our environment. You have to understand how is that technology, how is it embedded in um, societal norms and values. So basically the problem here is that we're really realizing that the world is really complex and rich and that makes it um, difficult to design technology. But it's also exciting, so <laughs> that's why I'm in this area of work. So let's look a little more specifically at what we do and how we do it in order to get at some of these issues and try to address this in a systematic form. Well, the first thing is that we try to understand what people do and how they do it by identifying the features and the practices that really need to be supported, and then more importantly, identifying what not to do. So I always have people coming up and asking me, well, point to something that HCI has helped design really well. And the thing is, it's kind of hard to point to one thing. A lot of times, it's part of a group of people who work very closely together with a perspective that the human is an important part of the system and how it's being used. And because of that, it's very hard to point to one thing. But more often than not, that somebody in the field can at least point to one thing that was not implemented due to an understanding of human use. And you can say, that's an example of something that HCI has helped with. So for instance, going into the operating room, it's really easy to say that um, you can just introduce the Kinect into the operating room. But the thing about the Kinect is that you have extremely large gestures. And the one thing that we identified very early on is that you cannot have large gestures in the operating room. So um, that's an example that I guess I'll go into a little bit more when I get into um, some of our findings from our study. Um, the other thing is that we try to translate and apply this knowledge into every aspect of a system's design and development. So a lot of times in the past, we talked about HCI as a field that focused on user interface design. So one that looked at the forward facing, um, the design of the user interface, what colors, what fonts to use. And that's still an important part of the field, but also we're starting to understand that an understanding of human, um, human use of technology and how technology is embedded into um, everyday life actually has implications for system design from the top down. And we have people in our group who are now we're, um, working um, with groups um, addressing file, uh, file system architecture. So that's how deep an understanding of human use of technology can go. And then we try to extrapolate our understanding um, from all of that and infer guidelines and principles to guide further design and development. And I think that's just a general focus of any research area. And so 
The unfortunate part of this is that, or maybe the fortunate, is that it's very iterative. So you're going back and forth between this understanding and this translation into design principles, and you're going back to once you have a system and you can implement it, and you can then understand something more about human use, and then you can um, extrapolate some guidelines and some ideas from that about generally how can you design for a particular type of um, technology or in a particular domain. We've done this in a lot of different environments. So my group is particularly focused in the, in the beginning with um, looking at home environments. So going into people's homes and understanding what is the smart home? What is this concept of introducing technology into the home? It really grabs people's attention, but we really don't understand um, all the different nuances of how people live in this extremely intimate um, arena and how they like to integrate technology into that environment. And since then, um, we've been focusing on more complex and more um, work-oriented environments, such as the work I'm going to present today, which is focusing on um, the operating room and how do surgeons use imaging systems. But no matter what environment we go into, it's really important to talk to the users and to talk to the knowledge experts. So we um, typically use observations and interviews as a fundamental aspect of how we gather data about people. And you can do that in a lot of different ways, but um, you can um, introduce uh, video cameras into people's homes and have them videotape the way that they use the technologies that are um, already occurring in their lives. You can sit down and you can, um, you can interview them before and after you introduce a technology and you can ask them how do they integrate this technology into their lives and to have them tell you stories about how they were able to integrate technology and what were some of um, the, the positives and negatives of that technology and why is that? It's always a good question to ask why. It's not always enough to just find out that something happened. Um, and then from all of that, it's really important to also have an understanding of what you see as um, a good outcome metric. So understanding not only that people use the technology, because I mean, that's very important. You wanna know that people used technology, but you also wanna understand well, um, why, how much, in what ways, when did they and when didn't they? Because in order to do research in this area, you can't just talk about um, um, the use of technology, whether or not it was successful or not. Because that really doesn't fundamentally provide us with generalizable knowledge that we can apply to other domains and other types of technology that are closely related. So it requires just a little bit more of an understanding of where you're going, what is an important evaluation that you need to be doing, what do you need to be getting out of people when you're interviewing them, what you need to be looking at when you're observing what they're doing. And it's also important, and this is typical um, work that a lot of us do, I know, which is iterative system design and development and taking it back to the users and get them to comment on that technology and to be able to tell you what they think and then take those lessons learned um, iterate, iterate on the design of the system and then put it back out into the field again and have it being used. And even though it's really scary to pull, uh, put stuff out into the field, the thing is, is that um, in the process of translating some of these findings into technologies, you can not only um, get really good information as to the best way to develop and design a system, but you can also understand what does that mean in terms of not just gestural interaction for this particular environment, not just gestural interaction for a particular type of an application, but if you're looking at this from a research standpoint, it's very important to be thinking about what do we understand about, say, gestural interaction as a whole. And so this is kind of um, the, the, the tough aspect, actually, because you might come up with an artifact. Here is something called WAVE, which was a home communication system that we did in our group. You might come up with an artifact that you learn particular things about um, um, how this system works. But when you're looking at this from a research standpoint, you have to be trying to take it to the next level and understand what did we learn about how people communicate in a home. Um, and that's important to be able to tease out this, um, what is provided by the technology, what is technology dependent, and what is actually a feature of home communication. Um, and of course, always paying attention to um, good design and being able to make sure that um, the information, the data, the user interface is engaging 
um, and provides a really good experience. And this is why we have designers in our group who are really focused on um, making beautiful objects, making engaging objects um, from every level, including the system that we designed for the surgeons, because they like pretty things too. And from all of that, we extrapolate a lot of this knowledge. So, of course, we write papers. <laughs> One of my papers. Um, but we also have books that sort of take it a different level. So after we've done a lot of the research um, in homes and looking at new technologies for the home, one of the things that our group came out with is um, a book talking about, well, what is this thing that we talk about, this smart home? And it's, it's laying forward a future for, what, for technology in the home um, that is freely available to anybody. And then also we've um, sort of gone a little bit higher and started to generalize, well, what did we learn about communication if you look across all of the type of technologies that we've engaged with, all the different domains that we've looked at, when we, um, we learned something very interesting about the concept of communication. For instance, that it's not so much about always transferring information from one person to another, but it can also be looked at as um, a way of gift giving between two people who have um, a close relationship with one another. A simple text message that can be sent from one person to another and then saved can be seen as a gift-giving mechanism. So communication is much more richer when you look at what technology is able to support right now than simply information transfer. And that opens up the design world for what we can imagine with communication technologies. Um, many of us probably five, 10 years ago maybe 10 years is closer, uh, would not have imagined Twitter and Facebook taking off the way it is. But if you look at the fundamental um, values that Twitter and Facebook support, which is um, self-presentation and um, connecting with other people and feeling like you have a role, a role in society and you have a community, well, all those things are supported by things like Twitter and Facebook. If we have an understanding of what is going on in the interrelationship between people and their technology, then you can um, design future technologies uh, that could probably make you as much money as Facebook. So, Although I'm a researcher, so I don't care about productization. <laughs> so where am I going with all of this? Well, the thing is, is that we have this new technology, and it's called Connect. And it came out about a year and a half ago. And just in case nobody knows what I'm talking about, um, Connect is a sensor, I have one up here, that originally came out with the Microsoft Xbox gaming platform. And what it was is it allowed for full body interaction. And so you can see these people here right now, um, they're trying to play volleyball on their really, really large screen. This cannot be their living room. And, um, and what you see here is you see that you know, they're able to jump and they're able to hit with their arms and they're able to have a great time without holding anything, without touching anything. It's full body interaction from the head, tip of their heads to the tip of their toes. And so this was actually a game changer in a lot of different ways. Um, it was a game changer in the gaming industry because up until that point we had the Wii and other types of devices that allowed for some type of more active gaming environment, but we didn't have it in an environment where you didn't have to hold any type of particular um, equipment and also it didn't usually involve the legs. It pretty much only paid attention to arm motions. And the thing about the Kinect is that it also opened the space of gestural interaction in a way that we really hadn't seen before because the Kinect was a fairly affordable, low-cost device that um, provided really robust information about um, limb postures. And um, because of that, a lot of people tried to think about, okay, well, now that we have this device, because gestural interaction had been around for a while, people had been studying, so it wasn't a new thing. Um, but now that we have this device, what can we do with this? Where can we put it? And this is what captured people's um, thoughts and attention and what we were um, really trying to do. Um, so the Kinect is a little adorable little thing. Um, and the important thing to mention here about this, just in case you're um, unaware of how the technology itself works, is that there is a microphone array, first of all. So um, although we think about gestural interaction with the Kinect, it also has voice control. It has its own infrared light sensor, which means it doesn't matter what the ambient light in the room is. It has its own light sensor. Um, this is why it works in dark rooms, which is one of the, um, the studies that we had done in our lab. If you want to know more about that, you can ask me um, after. <laughs> um, and what happens is the infrared light, light source 
comes out of the camera, bounces off of objects in its field of view, and then goes back to the infrared sensor, which then is able to use that information to determine um, the objects that are in its way and the depth that they are from um, the camera or from the sensor itself to the object that may be in its, um, that's in its field of view. Um, that is why not only are you able to move like this with the Kinect, but you're also able to move like this, and it's able to pick up all that information. So X, Y, and Z planes. Um, you also have an RGB camera, so the way that it was used in Xbox is to take funny little pictures of people, and that's about all an RGB camera is really good for. <laughs> and so that is the Kinect sensor. So we have this piece of hardware. It's really good. So let's just put it out there, and let's just let people use it and develop all these systems. Well, the thing is, is when you have a new piece of technology, when you have a new piece of hardware, you're not really done. Because what happens is you just opened up the door to some really big questions. You actually are at the beginning of the story, not the end. This is where we need to start using an understanding, not only of the technology and how we can make the technology more robust to be used in a lot of different environments, which you're going to be hearing about over the next few days, I'm pretty sure, at least one talk. Um, but you also have to understand, well, how? What's the best way to use this technology? And how do people want to interact with it? And how does that then inform how the technology needs to be iterated on in general. Um, so just to give you some ideas of some of the first things that we came up with. Well, the first question is, so what is really natural interaction? You hear people talking about it all the time. You know, the first thing that comes out of your head is intuitive, easy, you know, synonyms for natural. Well, OK, so we have minority report. Can you imagine doing this for eight hours a day in your office? I don't have the upper body strength, I'll tell you that much. Looks really cool in movies, but am I going to want to do that? Am I going to want to use my legs to kick around the mouse? Can't really imagine doing that either. I can imagine doing that in my living room when I'm playing, you know, one of the football games, but I can't really imagine that in other environments. And so this is where you start breaking apart this concept of natural interaction. It's not really the technology that's natural. It's not the hardware. It's not the interaction mechanism. When you're thinking about what natural interaction is, it's really more than that. It's about how you use that technology in a particular environment. And this is, again, why you have to get out of your office and you have to see what people are doing and what they need and how they want to interact. Because until you're able to do that, it's not going to be natural. You can't fall back on the technology and say, well, it's natural just the way it is. It's something a little bit more than that. And this is a perfect example to talk about natural interaction. So you have multiple users. Well, I don't know how many of you have played the Xbox um, with the Kinect, but you have to be fairly close to one another, especially in most um, living rooms here in the UK. You don't have that much room. And the thing is, is that you do have a tendency to bump into your friends, your family members when you're playing. Now, that's really great when you're playing. You know, you, you have that sort of rivalry where you're like, oh, you know, get out of my way. I'm going to, you know, steal your avatar. Um, that's okay. But there's a lot of environments where this close proximity to one another really doesn't play a part. And how do people cooperate with the same avatar when you have two people? This is a question that's really not understood. We have multiple connects with the hardware and the software, or multiple skeletons with the hardware and the software of the connect, which can be tracked. But we don't really understand all the ways that we can develop an application on top of that in order to really support people, multiple people being able to use the system. And then, of course, there's the question of what do you really model when you get close up? So if you wanted to have, um, say, a laptop, like, for instance, I keep having to walk over here <laughs> to hit the keyboard. Well, what if I was just able to walk up to my, um, my laptop and say, OK, go to the next, the next part of my presentation? What do I really want to, to model when I'm getting close up? Is it just my arm? Is it something else? 
What if I start walking up and I start hesitating with my body? Is that useful information for the system to know, no, don't go forward yet? I'm actually just gesturing towards the presentation, but I'm not actually wanting it to move forward. These are a lot of the questions that we start thinking about when we think about the application of a technology in an environment. So now I get to the system that we were trying to, um, to address. We, when the Connect first came out, there's a lot of people who were thinking the great place for using this, this technology is in an operating theater. And the reason why this is so important um, primarily is because surgeons are sterile. So you'll see here they have, uh, the surgeon here has a gloved hand. And an operation can take anywhere from, say, downwards of one to three hours and upwards of like 12 or plus hours. Um, throughout that period of time, there are motivations for having to use um, computer systems in order to interact with new imaging technologies. And when I'm talking about imaging technologies, you know, I'm talking about things like fluoroscopic x-rays, which are live x-rays where you can actually see things changing over time. It's very low level, low dosage of, um, of uh, x-rays of radiation, but um, it is an x-ray and um, they want to minimize the use of that as much as possible. So that's the first thing. Um, but it can go up to um, really complex 3D MRI or CAT scan um, uh, images that have been rendered that um, are really important for understanding the anatomy of the surgical patient. And um, these are being used more and more. And the reason that they're being used more and more is just the general direction that surgery is going in. So here's a really, really bad um, graphic that I found on the internet, but I thought it worked really well. Um, on the left-hand side here, we have the open heart surgery. So this is what we typically think of when we think of surgery. We think of um, actually opening the body and being able to display uh, the anatomy that the surgeon is going to be working on. And up until about 10 years ago, this was pretty much it. Over the past 10 years, and definitely in the next five to 10 years, this is where surgeons are going. More and more minimally invasive surgeries. The idea is not actually to open up the body because that opens up the body to pathogens that slows down healing and recovery time. There's all these complications that can occur. It actually takes more time, the overall surgery, which means that the patient um, is going to be under anesthesia for a much longer period of time if you um, have to do these um, open types of surgery. So the direction is to do minimally invasive surgery, to use small incisions to insert various types of equipment into the body, into the body cavity, to be able to repair or insert um, uh, sterile equipment. And then to be, in order to see what they're doing, this is where they're really, really, really reliant on various types of images. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to allow them to be able to interact with those images that they're becoming more and more reliant on without having to break their own sterility barrier. So this is what we used to imagine the way the surgeons would be interacting with the patient, but head down into um, looking at the patient table. But this is in fact the direction that, um, that you're seeing uh, surgeons interacting at the table. They have their equipment that they're working with, but all of their heads are up because they're all looking at the images together. That's the scrub nurse. She doesn't count. So, so here we go. We have a problem. This seems a really straightforward um, problem. And about a year and a half ago, we did um, sort of just a proof of concept. So I'm going to show you a quick little video here. It's just proof of concept. You can see here these green lines that are showing where the hands are in relationship to the image, the really large, large image. By doing a circle, you can open up a menu. And by moving your hand from one menu item to the other, you can do things like rotate, clip in, and then I think it goes up to zoom. And then do a circle again to get out of the menu, and then you're able to look at the image. Really simple pro proof of prototype. Worked great. You have a Kinect. It was totally able to pick up the hands. 
It was able to um, allow the user to select various types of manipulations on the image. Uh, the image manipulated great, uh, felt like they had great control over it. So we're done, right? We can ship this, right? <laughs> so the thing about something like, um, like this system is that it's really focused on, here we go, sorry about that, I just wanna pause it. It's really focused, the design of the system is focused on what is best for the technology. So the Connect when it first came out was a little jittery. It's never quite exact as to where your hands are. Um, and so one of the best ways to design a system that worked really, really well, that was effective and efficient, for a user to actually do manipulations was to have a menu system, really large buttons that you can place your hand in sort of in the area, and then it selects clipping, rotating, zooming in, et cetera. So although that is a really great way of doing it, the problem is that it sort of obfuscates why the surgeons are doing the rotation. Why are they trying to clip in? It's not always about just getting the image to a state and then looking at it. The thing about surgeons is when they're using the images, they're thinking while they're rotating. They're looking while they're clipping into various planes of the, of the, the skull or the spine. And so being able to focus on where my hand is um, dependent on where a menu item is actually breaks the thought process while rotating and clipping from the actual action of doing it. So this is an example of how going into the environment and first understanding how somebody is using a technology and what do they need from it is actually um, a more successful way in the end to develop a system. So what did we do? Well, we did a lot of neurosurgery field work. Um, so we were looking at um, uh, issues with spines, so spines that were um, needed to be strengthened, and so they needed to insert screws and um, other types of bars. Um, and then we also um, uh, were able to observe a number of tumor uh, excisions, so one in the, sprain, uh, the spine and two in the brain. And so um, this is not a lot of field work, to be honest. This is probably about 20 hours of field work if you count it up. But what you can learn from 20 hours of field work is quite, quite immense. So here's my first video. So here we have um, a surgeon who's right at the beginning of uh, the surgery, and he has to go over to check the imaging system, which is on the wall right now, um, to make sure that they are, um, uh, they needed to check to see what way the spine was curving because they were going to do a fixation on the spine. Yeah. Come in for a second. Okay, to the right, agree, okay? So this is a perfect example of why, um, this is a very simple example of why surgeons really need to um, be able to have hands-on interaction. He needed something really quickly. He needed to change the image that was currently being displayed on the PAC system. That's a picture archiving and communication system, which is what they call these imaging systems that are um, throughout the hospital. Um, and he wasn't able to because he had already started the surgery, so he was already sterile. He had already scrubbed up. It was something very, very simple. It was just clicking on one image and then clicking back. Um, and so what he had to do is he had to turn around and he had to find somebody who could do it for him. He had to find a nurse who was not one of the scrub nurses. She was one of the helper nurses. And he had to have her come over. And you see this thing where he's hovering. And he's like, click up here. Now move down here. Now go over here. And so a very simple example of what we're trying to support here. The thing is, is that the simplicity of this example is not really the way that they naturally want to be um, able to interact with the images because usually they are um, having to stop and descrub in order to move through the images, to be able to click through the images and discuss them, as you'll see in this clip. So you have two surgeons here, one that was scrubbed, but he unscrubbed in order to use the mouse, and his colleague.
So in fact, I think we're okay to up down because those two TPs on my side are very close to the of three and four. So and the one below is five, which is right against the uh, a -lar. So you see you have two surgeons, and the first surgeon, who the, the gentleman on the right, what he's doing is he's using the mouse scroll wheel to scroll up and down through slices through um, the spinal cord. So what slices are, are images going in this direction, up and down the spinal cord. And so there's a particular part of the spinal cord that he wanted to go up and down, and it allows him to have a gestalt, a full understanding of the spinal um, anatomy as he goes and steps through over and over and over and over again. So he's going up and down and up and down, and his colleague then is looking and he's pointing and he's talking about the images at the same time. So we see a couple of things. We see the importance of being able to look and think and do action all at the same time to be able to do those interweaved with one another. How an action is not the focus of his attention. He's, he has his focus of attention on the images themselves, be able to view them and to think about what is he looking at while he's doing the action of going up and down with the mouse. And then, of course, you have this discussion that's going on around the images with his colleague and this pointing and this um, discussion and pointing at the same time, again, continuing with the action at the same time. So these are all the different types of things that are happening in just a very short clip of looking at, um, looking at the images. What's unfortunate is that the surgeon had a point where he had a problem and he had to descrub. And basically what happens after this point is he had to take off his gown, go and re-scrub up again, and put his gown and his gloves back on again. That takes time. It takes anywhere from like 10 to 15 minutes, so it's, no, it's not chump change. Yeah? Why not use a sterile mouse? So a sterile mouse is possible. You can put something over it, but it's not really sterile. In terms of sterility practice within the hospital, they don't consider that really sterile. They make excuses sometimes for wrapping things in baggies, putting protective coverings. But um, if there's a way to do this in a manner that is actually free from touching things, that's the direction that, um, that infection control wants to go into. Um, and the problem is really around MRSA, which is, um, I don't remember what it actually stands for, but it's a highly infectious, um, <sighs> Not antibody. Bacteria. bacteria thank you. <laughs> it's a really highly infectious bacteria, and they're trying to fight that on a regular basis. So I talked to them about this. You know, you always talk about why can't you just wrap something up? And the fact is, you always have um, an, a margin for error. And so this is a, this is one of the motivations for going into gestural interaction is to cut down on touching as much as possible. That's a good question, though. Um, Another thing you see is the need to use images actually at the bedside. So being able to, um, in this situation, screw in a screw into the spine of this patient and then be able to look at x-rays and be able to make an adjustment and to be able to look at x-rays. Now, and you can see this constantly. So they'll do this over and over again. Very quick succession, 40 seconds later. And he's yeah. made an adjustment, now he needs to look at a new x ray. And although this is an example of them not actually having to physically manipulate the images because all they're doing is um, hitting a, um, a button on the floor, which is a sterile way of interacting, by the way, um, to be able to bring up a new image. The point here is that as they come up with new imaging techniques and as they're more important for minimally invasive surgery, you're going to see more and more this need to be able to intermingle the work on the body at the same time while looking and manipulating the images. And they do this for like three hours, so I don't know how they do it. Oh, I don't know how they stand there for that long. Like, honestly, I was, after an hour, I was like, I need a chair. I'm not, I'm not built like a surgeon, but... Why should it? Yeah, no, that's, absolutely. That's a you Especially have. if you're able to give this, give the same functionality and the same level of control. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, 
The other thing that they're having more and more are um, multiple types of images. So we have a previously a pre-op MRI scan. You've got um, a current MRI scan overlaid with um, a location marker. So they have these little uh, markers that they can put into the body to see where it would show up um, on the pre-op. And then um, you have a, an endoscope video camera um, over here all the way on the right. And you see them doing this, this discussion over and over again, going between these different images, talking about how they're related to one another. Yeah, that you can see in there is into this bit here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Which is not where we need to be, but this is just giving us a bit more space. Yeah. And so they're constantly looking back and forth between these different types of images and discussing them and talking about how this over here is related to this over here. No, no, you need to move a bit over here. I think that, that means over here, you know, a little bit up from where you are um, on the endoscope. And this discussion is really important because they're adding more and more images in order to have more and more of an understanding of what's going on inside the head or inside of the spine. And some of the questions are, well, first of all, are we able to provide them with sort of overlays that would allow them to do this much easier? And also, um, if we can add gestural interaction to those overlays, they can have those discussions all on one imaging system. Um, and be able to, to have that, um, that full understanding on one display. Even if we can't though, one of the things you have to think about is if you provide gestural interaction for more than one of these displays and they have an overlapping um, area of view, how do you address um, which gestures are applying to which imaging system? So these are some of the issues that come up. Yeah. Really big. And, and in, in a guided environment, if somebody makes a mistake, they might lose a point. But yeah. It seems very critical and it always works. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I can tell you that um, it's getting better. <laughs> so we have been able to develop a system, and, and I'll demonstrate it in a little bit, um, that has been able to allow for manipulation. But as soon as you're trying to get for very fine control, so being able to keep your hand in a particular location, that's not quite good enough yet. I think that's the direction it's going in, though. Over time, it's definitely going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, the best way to make a system ignore something is one of two ways. Uh, the way we did it, which is um, indicating, OK, system, listen to me now. Um, so having two different modes. But another way to do it is if you have a very well-defined gesture set um, and you train the system um, with various machine learning algorithms to pay attention to only those gestures, then those that reside outside of those gestures are going to be ignored. So for instance, let's say, you know, I only want you to pay attention to those gestures which have to do with playing baseball. Well, that means if, I'm, if I do something that's associated with football, then the system will ignore it because it's outside of the gesture set that I've already defined for it. Yeah. Right. And that's the situation where you have to have um, various mo modalities. You have to tell the system that this is when I need you to pay attention to me. And the way we do it with our system is telling the system, I now want control, which allows you to manipulate it, but then you have to lock the image, and then you can use your, your gestures for discussion. I can show you in the demo. You guys will uh, see that very soon. Um, so we see a lot of challenges that we were faced with here. We had a, the occluded body. So for instance, only from here up was able to be viewed. And before the recent SDK that came out, which actually was in response to this, we were dealing with a system that was looking for a full entire skeleton. And whereas you had people at the, um, at the table which were occluded by the patient body in front of them. We have the close proximity of users, so we have two surgeons usually standing side by side with one another, and, and there's also a scrub nurse close by. You have occupied hands, so sometimes if they're doing the surgery, they might only have one hand available to do some of the gestures. 
you have multiple displays that they're trying to control at the same time. So how do you deal with which gestures go with which displays? You have the issue of the discussion and the interaction, and how do you um, dis um, sort of uh, tease those apart and be able to discern which one is for, for which? And then um, the other really interesting thing that came out is this idea of sterile interaction area. And this is um, what we found was that surgeons consider from about here to here and about as far as a little bit further out from their shoulders is their area of interaction. They don't, they're not allowed to actually um, reach above their heads for fear that they might touch um, a light or some other type of equipment. Um, if you start reaching out um, to your sides, you're probably going to uh, touch one of your colleagues in an unsterile part of their body. Um, and obviously below, uh, below the belt is going to be the patient. So you'll see surgeons walk around a lot when they're not doing anything. You'll see them walk around like this because they know that this is their sterile, this is their home. This created quite an interesting um, challenge for us because that means you want an interaction gesture set that exists sort of in this area right here. You don't want them to be doing really, really large gestures because that's just not going to happen um, for lots of different reasons. So these are some of the challenges we are faced with. But we also have these opportunities where we see that giving them hands-on control allows for speed and accuracy because you don't have to tell somebody what to do, somebody who's probably not all that trained at looking at the images the way you are, and also providing them with this ability to think while they're doing. And then also being able to bring the images together around the table we saw as an opportunity that we could provide. So, demo. This is the fun part, right? If I could just get my So this is a system that we built for guys in St. Thomas's Hospital, which is down in London. This is for vascular surgeons. So what they're trying to do here is you have a 3D aorta get out of the system view here. You have a 3D aorta, which is um, rendered from preoperative CAT scans, overlaid on top of 2D uh, X-ray image that was taken during the operation itself. And so here's in a situation where we're actually being able to merge pre-op and inter-op uh, images together to allow them to be able to look at the relationship between what they're doing now and what are they, where do they need to go. Um, the, one thing you hear from surgeons is that they think in 3D. It's really important for them to be able to look at 3D images. So we have the little uh, screen down here, which shows our um, skeleton, which is always very useful. And then you can see that I'm able to point to various parts of the anatomy with my little green arrows. And I'm not actually manipulating the image. And so I can say, well, you know what? I think uh, we're going to be going into that area, which is uh, one of the arteries that go down into the um, kidneys. So that'll be the left kidney. So I'll say, Kiko, control. And you can see I can do various types of rotation here, because I now have control. Ha, ha, ha. Kiko, thank you. <laughs> Kiko, lock image. Kiko, place mark. Kiko, X position. So now when they're looking at the live fluoroscopy x-rays, they're able to see exactly where that artery is in relation to the spinal cord. And so when they um, put their catheters up into the artery, they can actually see still on the x-rays these metal catheters because they show up on x-rays, whereas soft tissue does not show up on x-rays. All you have is bone. 
And so they're able to then see where the catheter is and they're able to make that relationship between what they know about the anatomy from the 3D preoperative CAT scans and what they actually have at their disposal during the surgery, which are these, um, uh, these fluoroscopic X-ray images. And so you can see a couple of the things that we were able to do here. Um, we were able to have this um, ability to not control the images and be able to just point to them from afar and be able to use our hands to discuss the various images. Um, and then you also see that we have the ability to say, Kiko, control. Kiko, control. Thank you. And to be able to then manipulate the images as you want. Ha, huh, that was cute. Kiko, lock image. One of the things that you see, maybe, um, I don't know if you're looking at me close enough, um, is that I will pull my hands back when I want to replace my hand. And by being able to do that, we call it a clutch mechanism. I'm able to rotate right in my area, my sterile area, for instance, or be able to zoom in and zoom out in my sterile area. And then if I want to continue to zoom in, I can zoom in, pull back, and go back out and zoom in. So this is the way that we were able to support um, being able to stay within sort of that sterile zone that's really important for surgeons to stay in because again, they're not playing in this crazy um, Xbox world. And um, so uh, we actually deployed this system down at uh, the hospital in the beginning of May and it's been used probably about a half a dozen if not slightly more times now. Um, for various complexity um, stent insertions. So what they're trying to do is they're um, inserting uh, strong metal meshes up inside of uh, the aorta in order to strengthen it because the wall has slightly weakened due to you know, poor diet, plaque buildup, et cetera, um, high blood pressure. So, um, and it, we've had a lot of really um, good feedback from the surgeons who have used this thus far. Um, we've, since this is actually about, this demo is probably about three weeks old now, maybe four weeks. So um, since this demo, uh, the new Connect SDK came out, which was the Waste Up SDK. Um, and it also does even better when you're closer to the system. Um, and we've made a few changes with the voice control because we found that the voice control is just a little bit too sensitive when you just say, you know, Kiko control just really quickly like that. It, um, it'll just be picked up by like random words that are also said. So now we've added a bit of a pause. We say Kiko, you wait for a pause, you wait a pause and you'll see it, it gives you a little sign that it's listening and then, and then you say control or exposition or whatever that you're asking it to do. So this is what's happened. We've iterated on this system probably about um, four or five times now. So I think this is about version five, the one that we currently have running down there, actually today, my colleagues are down there today, um, is uh, about version five right now. And um, the lessons that we've learned from here have been really interesting now that we are also working with uh, neurosurgeons down at Adam Brooks, which is down here in Cambridge. And so what we're providing with that for them is a slightly more simple system to rotate and manipulate um, uh, 3D brain images um, and to be able to also clip through those images. So being able to clip through slices of the brain in order to address, um, uh, be able to remove brain tumors. Um, it's interesting for us to be looking at two different environments because the lessons that you learn in one environment may not always be applicable to another. And so this is one of the motivations for doing research because there's a lot of people developing these systems. They're, they're out there, people are using them already. But um, from a research perspective, we really wanted to be able to understand what can we learn about gestural interaction when we're looking in this domain, which is quite broad. Because if you think of all the different types of surgery and all the different types of imaging systems that are out there, they require a different level of gestural interaction. And what can we learn about the differences and the similar similarities about um, how people uh, interact? And also, um, when people interact with this, how does it change the actual practice of the surgery itself? which is um, a really important 
thing to have to start discussing as we're talking about the introduction of images um, for minimally invasive surgeries over the next five to 10 years. So. <laughs> Yeah, let me also just mention that, um, of course, after the, the system in St. Thomas got, uh, went, went live, the BBC went down with Helena and her team for filming. So there was a, a fair amount of press coverage recently, and Helena is, uh, um, has become a media star. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, I'll uh, give autographs <laughs> later. No, we were, yeah, it, was it was really was funny. We were freaking out there because the BBC is there, and you're thinking, please do not break. For once in your life, work. <laughs> But it did. Everything worked out okay. Yeah, it was great. And it's, it's especially wonderful you have good for, for these research projects and then get press attention. And you see, you know, there's suddenly within the company and, and outside the company and universities a lot of uh, interest created to use something like that for their research. So it certainly gives... Um, gives, gives very good PR. And, and actually, yeah. that's been quite helpful because... Um, People all over the world that are interested in this area right now, I mean, they're coming from all different areas. You've got um, in-house surgical teams and you have little companies that um, cropped up. And um, they've been contacting us ever since the BBC piece, which is really important because you wonder what is your research good for sometimes. Um, but finding out um, the lessons that you learn can really inform the systems that are going to be going out there and going to be used by surgeons all over the world. We were just talking with someone today who's um, selling his system to uh, people in Singapore and, um, and in India. And they don't have really complex systems, but this is affordable enough for them to be able to do. And it's highly important for those environments where infection is on the rise um, in their hospitals because they don't have the ability to do as, as high sterile infection uh, control as we're able to do, say, in the UK. So that, that's just fabulous to know that we can help them. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, and especially this point that you made is what, what is your research good for? I just yeah. had a discussion over lunch at one of the posters. Uh, a student received that question, what is this good yeah. for, for first year PhD? And that, of course, is an important thing to, to think about before, yeah. before you start to... You never know what it's going to be in the beginning. Yeah. But, uh, but always be open to, to new ideas because you never know really who would really want to hear more about your research and who really would, would use the lessons that you have. Mm -hmm. Right, so are there some questions for Helena? So what if it breaks during the operation? What other type of control <laughs> is there for surgeons after that? You know what, that is a really, really good point. So one of the first things that we did is we discussed um, uh, what's your backup plan? So especially when you have a research system and, uh, and you're not, especially the first few times, um, we just were going to go back to the way they do it. Uh, it's mouse-based as well. And so they always have technicians that are able to manipulate the images for them. And so they would just go back to doing that, which is one of those situations where they call out and they say, OK, can you move it a little to the left? No, a little to the right. It's not ideal because, again, they're using their words and they're trying to think about the images at the same time. But um, that's the first thing you should always be thinking about. I think that there's a point in the future where um, they're planning on removing the technicians from the situation. I mean, that's one of the motivations is to not have to have extra personnel. It reduces cost, of course. But that's not going to be until this has been well tested and vetted out. Yeah. Um, I'm also interested to know what, what the surgeons, uh, what, what their experience of using it is, because sometimes they can be quite skeptical of, yeah. of technology. So. I'm wondering what what their what their impression of it was, yeah, and yeah. the u the user I mean the usability of the of the system. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, so surgeons are surgeons. <laughs> they they are a great group of people to work with. Um, they tell you exactly what's on their minds, and they don't want crap. So um, that's one of the reasons we did a lot of iterations on the design before it actually ever went into the OR. Um, we would always put it in front of them, let them try to break it, tell us what they really wanted and what they didn't want. Um, from time to time, they'll contradict themselves, but you have to understand what's the motivation be behind their different seemingly contradictory requests. I think that um, we've been very lucky, though, that we've actually been working very closely with a couple of surgeons. So it's not only a user group who we've like gone out to and been like, here, we've built this, play with it. But they've been um, integral and part of the discussion and, and testing it out and thinking about how do they want to change it and what do they really want to use it for. And um, 
I think that is what allowed us to make a system very quickly, but also one that they were very happy to use. Now we're in a situation where the surgeon that we're working with down at Guys in St. Thomas's is actually going to go away on leave, um, I believe Afghanistan, to uh, be in the Army Medical Corps for like three months, two months, something like that. Um, and so his replacement, uh, who's going to come in and use the system, he hasn't been part of all of this discussion. So actually my colleagues are down there today watching him do a fairly complex um, uh, in, uh, stent insertion uh, with the system. Now he's played with it a couple of times, um, but he has already given us the feedback. It's a little jumpy, I want this to be smoothed out, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really important though. I mean, to not only work really closely with, with um, somebody who's representative of your users, especially when you're dealing with experts, but also then to have it you know, beaten up by those that are outside the team. I think that also justifies what you were saying earlier about going to the field and actually getting to know what the scenario is like before you introduce the technology. Oh, yeah. Because coming from the same HCI kind of background, I always find it hard to, to justify to people that I'm not developing the technology, but I'm trying to study people outside of that and then in the context of the technology. So I think it kind of links back to what you were saying earlier about the importance yeah. of getting to know who your user group really is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's absolutely true. When you're dealing with um, the healthcare uh, area in general, they're very skeptical skeptical of people just coming in and they're thinking, oh, this is just another person who has, you know, like PhD dissertation or something. They're going to come up with some crazy system and then they're going to leave us and then they're not going to support it and then we're not going to be able to use it any longer. So it's about trust is really important if you want to be able to look at this as a long-term endeavor, but also one that's fairly successful. We're not interested in productizing that, which is, which is very difficult you know, to, to make that clear, but we also made it clear that we are not going to just leave them in the lurch, that we really are trying to support a broader area of research, and so however we're able to continue that relationship without getting too sucked into it, I think it's interesting to co continually have those conversations and keep that trust going. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we just had uh, have my colleague uh, Antonio come in, who's yeah. actually <laughs> going to pick up this topic and not look at it look at medical imaging from the HCI side, but from the machine learning side. So that's going to be very interesting, and he's been involved in, the, in this research. But yeah, thank you very much, Elena. Thanks, so, guys. Very exciting talk. Thank you.